All right, hot diggity dog. <clears throat> Good Monday morning, everybody. See a Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert and friends all over the world. This glorious planet of ours, welcome. It's a great Monday morning. It's Labor Day. And uh, we're blessed to be together on this uh, <clears throat> wonderful uh, Monday morning. Got a very, very special show. I like to think of them all as special. Uh, but it's, and, and it's really great to have one of our very own on the show, uh, Mr. Gilmore Rizzo. Where are you, pal? I know you're the, there. You look at him. <laughs> That's Good morning. Smile. Good morning. That smile we all know and love, huh? So how about you just sit there and let me just bathe you and everybody else in your accolades? <laughs> just bring it on. I think a lot of people, uh, well, I'm sure a number of people that are tuning in already know who you are. Um, and I hope to expose you to an even greater audience here. So I'm just going to read this right from what I have here in my notes. And then uh, <laughs> you can enhance. Uh, we already have a question. Okay, just one second, gang. Let me get through the intro at least. Oh, please, first. <laughs> That's one of the things we love, Gilmore, is that uh, we love to have people kind of mix it up with us, comments, questions, things like that. So hang on to that question. Uh, and by the way, Reverend Lori Savage is in the producer's booth today. So we're grateful to have two of our own on the program uh, helping make this work. So Gilmore Rizzo, award-winning musical theater and cabaret performer, two-time best male cabaret artist uh, and Broadway World Award nominee, cousin to legendary singers Bobby Darren and jazz flugelhorn player Chuck Mangione. Did I say that name right? I think I That's did. That's correct, yeah. Uh, Gilmore uh, was seen as Tony for eight and a half years. This is so cool. On the Emmy Award winning series, Murphy Brown. Um, guest appearances on Roseanne, Matlock, Step by Step, Ellen, The Finale Boys, Murder, She Wrote, Living in Captivity, and also a freelance producer for a number of, uh, for HGTV, A&E, SoapNet, E!, Discovery Channel, and Bravo. Um, there's a few more paragraphs here. Can we stop there or else I feel like the whole show is sure. going to be me doing your biography. <laughs> we want to get to know you a little bit personally, too. I don't want to take up 45 minutes just reading from the screen here. Yeah, I've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> How are you this morning, my friend? What's going I'm on? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Reverend Charles. Right on. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate your, uh, your time. I appreciate being asked. Thank you. Right on. So where, uh, uh, where are you joining us from today? I'm in Palm Desert, just a few blocks away from the church. Oh, cool. Right on. Right by the center. Awesome. And you and your partner, Brian, your husband, Brian, have lived here for how long? Four years. Four years. And where did, so were you over in Hollywood before that? Where did you North come to the desert yeah. from? North right. Hollywood? So what do you think of this heat? Like, people are probably done with me talking about it. But when it gets 120, how, how are you with it? I'm a lush person. <laughs> I like green. I like mountains. I like the ocean. I am not a desert person at all. But it seemed like the perfect move at the time. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, I, I can adjust. I've adjusted living in several places before. Easy. Yep. And uh, I've grown to really like it. The people. Cool. Uh, you're in air conditioning all the time. So you're... You know, you're either in an air conditioned house or a car or another building. So it's just a few seconds when you have to walk through and roast, turn into ashes, and then you re <laughs> rehydrate when you're in the building. <laughs> and then, like a phoenix, you rise over and over again every day. Yes. And I also have, I also have a friend. Uh, her name is Lori Savage. I'm sure you've heard of her. Uh, she has a pool. <laughs> So oh, it's always great go. to have friends who have pools. <laughs> friends with pools, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. It's like having a friend with a boat. <laughs> yes, friends I don't want to own a boat, but I want to know someone who owns one. So there you're you listening. Go, <laughs> there you go. All right, let's see what, so let's see what this question is right off the bat. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, where did the name Gilmore come from? Family name? It's actually uh, Gelormo. But uh, that's what my dad, my dad is Jalormo. I'm a, I'm a junior. That's a whole nother show. Um, <laughs> he, it, he uh, <laughs> apparently in New York, a Jalormo is a knucklehead. So mm. it became Jalormo to Gilmore. And I was either going to be named Mark or Dino. And when I was okay. born, my dad said, this kid will have no other name but mine. And I was stuck with it for a very long time and I hated it. 
until I realized there aren't very many Gilmores out there. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of last names of Gilmore, yep. but Gilberts, you know, Gilroy I've seen, but <clears throat> I'm unique in many ways. Do you have a, from, from some of the things I've gathered, you, you, you come from a pretty traditional Italian family, yeah? I mean, the, the, with the huge, food and the music and... Huge, huge Italian family. So yeah. where do you trace your roots back to? Where, where do you know, how far back have you looked at your family? What do you know about your my, family history? My mother's side is all Siciliano, all Sicilian. And my dad's is a mixture of all Northern Italy. And uh, so when the two got together, of course, there was that sort of uh, family dynamic that the Northern thought they were better and the Sicil Sicilianos <laughs> thought they were better. But every Sunday we would go over to my grandma Rizzo's house and there was homemade Italian food, always. And she made everything from scratch. She made her pasta from scratch, her sauce from scratch. Um, even when there were hard boiled eggs in the dish, I would think, did she make those too? Because <laughs> she did, she made it, she was so proud of that. Wow. And uh, it was every Sunday and I have a love-hate relationship with it because every time I go to an Italian restaurant, I compare, mm. is it as good as her sauce? Mm. You know, she stuffed her own sausage. So everything she did was perfection. Do you have her recipes? Are they passed down through the family? My sister has them. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I have I I have all the desserts. I can okay. I keep, I have go. all the desserts. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I keep my figure. So <laughs> <laughs> So is your sister willing to share if you say, hey, I want to make grandma's meatballs? Is she share oh, the recipe oh, with you? Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So so that so Sundays were it must be if it was an all-day affair then, huh? Yes. From the cooking to the family and the whole thing. Was that and and of course all the music that they would listen to. My grandfather played the mandolin and the violin. And then in a work accident, he lost his index finger and was able to play anymore. And that really broke his heart because he was a mm. beautiful uh, violinist. And um, the music that we would listen to was all traditional Itali American Italian singers, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, Connie Francis, and the list was endless. And that's how um, I formed my own uh, taste in, in music because of what I listened to, all the influences. Mm. And uh, it just, I, I think I had a great education in, in, in music because of that. Wow, music and food, huh? Two of the two of the things that make the world spin. Oh, my favorite F word is food. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how was it? How was it? Um, uh, let's see. Do I want to go? So let's go here first. So okay. did you? So with with Bobby and with with Chuck, did you guys perform together much? Did you? Oh, or? I I didn't really know Bobby, but my my mom would receive his latest albums. Whatever he would cut something new, he was always sending her something because he just adored her. Now, Chuck, we got to meet at family reunions and those were he reunions were huge. Like, they must have been just massive, right? Yeah. I have something like 76 cousins or something like that. So, and they're all scattered all over New York and Boston and Chicago. So it's, it, it's, it was huge. And I remember him vaguely, but uh, my mom would always say, watch him on television. Say, oh, there's Chuck, there's Chuck. So. Right on, cool. But I think the it's in the DNA. I think I think theater and performing is in the DNA. So I just sort of latched onto that. Sounds like it. And if you haven't seen Gilmore perform, ladies and gentlemen, when you have an opportunity, make take it. I mean, it really is a treat. Oh, You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, someone's saying. Let's see who's saying a comment coming in here. Um, nice human says I really enjoyed your show at the church. Oh, Amore. thank you. Uh, any other projects in the works? They want to know Gilmore. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> my producer here today, uh, Lori, wants me to, to remount uh, a show that I did called Chew on This, Bubblegum's Anonymous Meeting. And it's the <laughs> bubblegum music of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Oh, wow. And the conceit is that the audience is going to a Bubblegum's Anonymous meeting because we all love bubblegum music, but we're afraid to talk about it in public. So it's one of those opportunities to really come out of your shell and announce that you will back this music till the day you die and you will talk about it and everyone gets sworn in at the end and it's great music and it's sing-along stuff. It's just a fantastic show. Um, the show that I did at the center, That's Amore, was about all about my Italian family and everything I learned from Science of Mind. Mm. Fun show. Yeah, very cool.
Thank you. What so helped school me up? I was born in 74. What's bubblegum music? Uh, bubblegum music is uh, monkeys, the Partridge family, the Archies. It has sort of that teen bop, you know. Feel gotcha. Okay. Early, early rock and roll kind of stuff like Connie Francis was considered bubblegum because she did lipstick on your collar and uh, stupid Cupid, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, <clears throat> so speaking of, so family, so what you, you. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, you were well, born in 74? 74. Okay. All right. What, what, what's that? Are you going to turn know. the interview around on me now? <laughs> 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 this is my show. Okay. Come on, best television was the early six, late sixties and seventies. Come on. <laughs> All right, move on. Oh, I'm my, the eighties was my decade. That was like I remember so. Actually, much I loved movies. a lot of eighties music. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I'm with yeah. Eighties and nineties. I was a I'm a product of. The, I'm the per, first hip hop generation and the grunge scene in Seattle. You know, so that's uh, that's that's kind of my thing. Um. <clears throat> I love this. So you have one kidney. I love this story. Will you tell the story about when you were a kid? Sure. Uh, I only have one kidney. Uh, when I was born, my mother had the flu and they thought she had gotten rid of it and I kept it and it infected mm. my kidney. So for the first four years of my life, I was always sick and I had my kidney removed when I was five. And the lady across the street from where we used to live in Torrance, her, her nephew, heard about this, he was an actor. Um, I didn't know the actor because he was an older actor and uh, he wanted to come over and see the little boy who was sick and had mm. his kidney removed. Because at that time in 66, they actually cut you in half. They cut you from your belly button to your, the middle of your back and I was sort of split open so they could wow. take it out. And uh, this man came over and I remember going in and out of consciousness and sitting next to me in, uh, on my bed was this man, handsome man, oh my God. I think that might have been the switch for me. But um, he sat next to me. And years later, when I was in high school, my mom recounted this story because I thought it was a dream. And this man, this wonderful actor came over to visit me. He gave me a, an Aquaman book. It was one of those big books. It was kind of square. And it was Aquaman and then this silly rubber monster that I kept for years. Found out later, the actor was James Garner. James Garner. <laughs> from Maverick and Rockford Files and yeah, and all the you know, couple Doris Day movies, just, I thought that was so kind of him. And I always wanted to run into him again because I worked a lot in the studios. I never had an opportunity to thank him and recount mm. the story. Wow, so, so there wasn't a, an ongoing relationship, it sounds like, just that, what, that one no, visit, huh? No, no I, thought, I thought it was a dream. Like somehow this spirit of <laughs> James Garner came to visit me and it was actually him. That's that's cool, James. I like James Garner. I've, I've, I've enjoyed his work over the years too. Yeah. Uh, a question coming in here, Gilmore. What is your favorite show business gig? What is your favorite show? What has your favorite show business gig been over the scope of your career? Well, it has to be Mur Murphy Brown was my favorite. I mean, I got to work with some of the best people. I was staging assistant for Gary Marshall. Gary couldn't rehearse during the week, so I stood in for him. So I got to act with Candace and Charles Kimbrough. And when they had guest stars on, like Olivia Newton-John, I was beside myself, huge fan of her. And unfortunately, she, she was very nervous that week because she came in for one day. Mm. And she was just so focused and concentrated. And I was just gushing all over her like a little girl. Oh, I you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and her reaction wasn't what I was hoping for. I was like, <laughs> best buds right after that and she take me out to lunch and we get to talk about the, you know and so I was, out I, that I was heartbroken for a couple of years <laughs> after that meeting you know you should never meet your your heroes but um i just last week uh because my my husband's going through a, a cancer journey right now we received the most amazing video from her oh Olivia really and john wow. sent a message to us for him because she's she's battling her third you know ex experience with this mm -hmm. and this time it doesn't seem like it's going in the right direction for her but um she just said keep a positive attitude and everything that you would you believe science of mind 
is about being present and your brain and your mind, you know, are so powerful. That's exactly what she said in this video. And we needed mm. to hear that at that time. Mm. So let's, let's go there for a moment then, since, since you brought it up, if you, if you don't mind it, you can share as much or as little as you want. Sure. So your husband, Brian has been, has been walking through this for, for quite a while now. And how's he doing? How, how's your family doing? Where are you guys? Um, it, 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 Let's see. And how to, and and on top of that, part two would be how do the principles support you guys in this walk? Okay, I was raised Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, that did that never sat well with me, and I didn't understand why this person in the sky was so mean and angry, and the nuns were so vicious to us. Uh, so the so nuns were I, vicious. The nuns were vicious. <laughs> when I when I uh, was growing up, I realized when my mom passed away. She died of the same thing that my husband's going through. So it's been the deja vu. Only this time I'm more present. And I realize how precious time and, and life is right now. And it, the thing that I learned from Science of Mind was how you need to be present every day. Don't live in the past. Don't think about the future. Don't worry about that. It's right here, right now. And I realized that when she passed, suddenly things started opening up. I'm thinking, I walked, I slept walked through life for 32 years. She died at 54. And it was heartbreaking. She was, one, she was one of my best friends. Absolutely. And I was going, <laughs> I went to the, back to the Catholic church with my grandparents. And I realized God is going to be a foreign word for me for the rest of my life. I will never understand it. I will never learn to, to appreciate it because of what I heard that, that Sunday when I went back. The following week, I was going to a grocery store I'd never been to before. The universe said, stop here. So I went in and as I was turning the corner in one aisle, I ran into David Bruner, Reverend <laughs> David Bruner, Dr. Bruner now, um, yep. who was the assistant minister at the time at North Hollywood. And he said, oh my gosh, Gilmore, I, I'm so sorry I heard about your mom. And I, he told me about his church. And I thought, you go to church? <laughs> I mean, I've known you for quite some time, David. I, really? And he said, no, if you go, I guarantee you, you'll find something that, that will change your life. So reluctantly, I went. I never laughed so hard or been so inspired by people that I realized they think like me. Mm. They, they believe like I do. And it was like the whole world just opened up. And he said, okay, Gilmore, you, you love Sunday, you're gonna love Wednesday. Wednesday is much more casual, it's a little more, more meditative. Um, if you go, I believe your life will change. I walked in, I sat down, and that was when I met my husband, 26 years ago. And it has been a journey of all the different emotions. And because we're on the same spiritual path and the same political path, we've had an amazing life. So we, we were living in North Hollywood and we decided to move to Palm Springs because we were already working here. We found a house. Um, I was afraid that we weren't gonna be able to find another spiritual center. So we moved here and we heard that there was one in Palm Springs. We moved to Palm Desert and I thought, eh, I'm gonna look online. And then I saw Joe, who, uh, you know, Dr. Joe, was here in Palm Desert. I was thrilled because he used to come and talk at the North, North, um, the NoHo Art Center, the Global okay. Trade Network, okay. Global Trade Center, and, <laughs> and I loved hear him, hearing him talk. I fell deeply in like with him from the moment he stepped on stage and started to talk. I thought he was someone I could really learn from. So when we moved here and realized this is where he was, I was so excited. You know, he, <laughs> I, we found a home. Yeah. And the people, and we, we, we have this little community of our own we call the, called the Row. The Row. <laughs> where all 10 of us sit in the same two rows every single Sunday. And whenever we'd have a friend come in from another city, we'd, have, we'd invite them to join the Row and acclimate them to the, you know, you got to come here. you got to move here. <laughs> and that's what happened. People started moving to Palm Desert to go to this center. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Wow. What a journey. It's, it's been, this teaching has helped me so much on this journey that I'm having with my husband. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because I got to tell you, without it, I would feel so lost and I would feel like I would feel hopeless and I would feel defeated by every turn. But that's not what this is. This is about knowing. And that's what that's what's been happening. We, we will know that it's going to go in a different direction than what we've been told. And it does. Mm. And it's all about your attitude. His attitude has been great. So, and I, I, I believe it's because of this teaching. Mm. And you also mentioned too, that you've got angels, angels that show up as friends all over in your life. What, I need to plug my computer in Gilmore. When I, while I do that, will you just talk about that experience? Sure, that sure. Form? Now, we, we have been so blessed over the years. I, mean, I have friends who have, I've known for 50 years who just continued to, to be with me when I was in uh, elementary school and we've just continued over the years. And when this pandemic hit and uh, we, were, we were hurting, it was like the angels just swooped in to offer to uh, deliver groceries. Um, there's a, something in, in town called the uh, Seniors Delivers. And I work for a group called PS Underground. Palm Springs Underground. It's a, it is a dinner theater show that it, it, the food is exquisite. Mm. And they, they wrote to me and said, we want to deliver food to you. Join this mm. service. We'll make sure that you get from us. So they've been delivering every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. wow. Yeah. And it's, Amen. and and we've been receiving cards and letters and, and, and my, my father stepped up. That was amazing. That was a manifestation in itself. That was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you have a kind of a, a shaky relationship with him, or how's how's? Well, he always says, you know, because he was such, he was such a, uh, a focused worker. He he was an elevator installator, and then he became an inspector. So he was his his mind was all about work. So he always he was a good provider. That's what a, that's what a husband does. He provides. Your wife does not work because if your wife works, you're not doing your job. Mm. My mother was the quintessential housewife and mother. She was. Donna Reed, Laura Petrie, Carol Brady, all rolled into one. And yeah, <laughs> she was amazing. Dinner on the table exactly at four o'clock as requested by my dad. And uh, so she always says, my wife raised two amazing children. So there was sort of that distance. I was, mom was my best friend. Dad was sort of the provider. And when he passed, we thought we'd, we'd get closer. I grew closer with my sister. We were already close. We were best friends anyway. But with my dad, there was still that strangeness. And uh, over the years, he's just sort of, he's evolved. Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, I talk with my hands. I'm so sorry. But, you know, if, if I, you I, do, down, I, I, can't, I can't speak. So I do the same thing. It's, it's like just, it, <laughs> it's, it's part, it, part, it's an extension of the mouth, isn't it? They're just there. I get it. You know, sharing that, Gilmore, makes me think of my grandparents, that that we, as, that my family was so committed, and they were hardcore Catholics, but they weren't hardcore enough to have family come second. It was always family first in, for us. And, and the grandkids, I know we kind of raised our grandparents as well, just in that they, they had to, I mean, we've been to jail. You know, we've got, uh, you know, gays, lesbians. I mean, we're, we've done, you know, we've got everything in our family now, and that's not the family they came from. Oh, I, so, I, don't, want you, I don't want you to think that I'm gay. I'm not gay. <laughs> but my husband okay. is. No, okay. <laughs> How was that for your family? Was there any dust up about that, being a gay man? I mean. Well, I was very fortunate because my uncle, my mom's brother, uh, is gay and has been in a, uh, over a 50-year relationship. Okay. So he's been married to his husband for 50, 54 years now, almost my entire life. And so that was my example. I saw a couple who lived, had homes, property, businesses, and it was just a matter of fact. You know, we, they, I, I saw how just like my parents' marriage, their relationship had, you know, the, the Christmases and they had the fights and they had the, you know, everything you go through, bills, Everything that a, a, a relationship has to deal with, they did that. Yeah. So to me, it was natural. Mm -hmm. And they would always say, you know, you remind me a lot of your uncle. Like, well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> but 
to talk about it. So hu humor seems very important to you. I mean, you you make me laugh, and the number of times that I've interacted with you, I laugh. Thank you. Thank you. And I, it seems I, I learned. Is that is that is that, a, is that a great value to you? Is it a value to you to bring into into your it, humanity? It is. It is. It it, it really diffuses a lot of things. Uh, my my father was a provider, but he was also extremely abusive to the boy. Mm. So, because you don't hit women, that's that's a sign of weakness if you hit it. But you can make a man out of a, out of a boy if you beat the. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had to do a lot of deflection because, of course, um, let's just say I was a little light in my loafers when I was growing up. So uh, going to school was tough. Mm. So humor got me out of a lot of fights and a lot mm. of sticking on me because I would make them laugh. Yeah, Does I, it feel? I, I, I'm I sorry. That laughter is also the best medicine. Yeah. Amen. It's good for my soul. Does it feel uh, more authentic to you now than it did then? I mean, as a deflection, but is it, it, it you're like, you're genuinely funny. Like, you know, I mean, are you, are oh. you trying to make the world laugh or is it just who you are now? Like is, when you said I, when you I were a kid. To, I have to consciously look for the, the positive mm -hmm. and the, the humor in situations. I do. It just, it, I, I feel better whenever I'm feeling a little down, I'll, I'll pop in something that I, I'm like the golden girls or the partridge family or something that I I'm familiar and just comfortable with it's yeah. like putting on an old, you know, shirt or old pajamas and just sort of feeling that. And I, it brightens my day, brightens totally. my life. You know, I, I'm, I'm a huge Shit's Creek fan. I haven't watched that yet, but I hear it's great. So I, 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 you have to get through the first season and okay. half of the second season. And then it says this little shift because the first, the first like season and a half is all character development. And because you have Eugene Levy and, you know, Catherine O'Hara, brilliant, brilliant comedians. The show is very witty. It's well-written. I highly recommend it. If you want to just to have something wash over you, that's funny. And there's a gay character, gay, gay couple in that. Again, it's a, just a matter of fact. There's no homophobia in the town. Everybody just accepts it. And that's what I also love about this center. Mm. It is so accepting. And of course, you know, with, um, with Dr. Joe, because he's very out, he's very open. Yep. And his congregation is very solid. To them, it's just a matter of fact. Oh, well, you know, he loves a man. Yeah. It's that's that. Choice. It's just who he is. Yep. 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 Did you have you did you have to dance? Well, I heard once um, I've been surrounded by all kinds of people my entire life, so I pr feel pretty good in my skin, no matter what, where who I'm with or where I am. Um, and I've said some stupid stuff over the years. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. I mean, just even, you know, as I've grown, thank goodness I've learned what I've learned. But that well, I've learning, never done that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that learning generally comes out of saying stupid things and. And one conversation I had, I made a stupid comment. This is like 15 years ago. I can't even remember exactly what the comment was, but I remember the person I was talking to saying, a gay man, everybody's homophobic to some extent. What do you think about that statement? And have you had to deal with much homophobia in your, in your life? Oh, of course. I mean, not, yeah. not to the point where it, it, it's been violent or it, it's um, affected my family or my, or, or my, my circle. It's never been that way because I, I have I believe in the law of attraction. I believe in what this center, what you focus on, you will come into your life. Yep. And, and I believe that I am I am surrounded by rock stars. Mm. I am surrounded by those people who just get this teaching. Mm. They understand it. They they won't tolerate or accept anybody being homophobic around me or my husband. They, it, it, it's, I, I, I believe that all the people that have come into my life that I've known since elementary school and through high school and they're still my friends to this day, all had that same thing that I was looking for that I, that I found when I started going to the North Hollywood Center for Spiritual Living. Mm. <clears throat> when I saw uh, Mark Vieira, Reverend Dr. Mark Vieira speak for the very first time, it, it was like somebody threw a cold bucket of water in my face for the past 32 years of my life. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what you missed out on. I was a spoiled Orange County brat who loved life and I had the best, you know, I, I, 
I didn't want need or want for anything because I always got it. Mm. When I found this teaching, I realized I was missing out on so much on being grateful. Today, I have an attitude of gratitude because of this teaching and the people mm. who are in my life to this day, I tell them every single day, I love you. And I appreciate you, everything you do in my life. And it's, uh, are you listening, Lori? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I, met, I, I met, love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that come? Um, so, another, another, that's one of your angels. One of your yes, angels. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, we met um, at the uh, Foothill Center of Religious Science, um, and in um, Sierra Madre. And she came in, and she 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 put together the program for a show that I was in. We had we did a, a benefit concert for a group called the Four Friends. And uh, she was part of the, the, the process of promoting this thing. So when she walked in, um, I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I kind of recognized her and we talked a little bit, but that was it. And then we got to <laughs> join forces when it came to uh, the special events. And I wanted to be in charge of movie nights. I thought that'd be so much fun. <laughs> and so she was my partner in this. And I have a tendency to go a little overboard. She's very grounded and I want to go big, 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 you know, as a producer, go big. And then you can kind of wean it back. Uh, so uh, we went, we were doing Mary Poppins and we had spoons covered with this tasty sugar and we gave away uh, tea packets and every movie had something edible that you could eat that kind of coincided with what you were watching. So when we did the long, long trailer with Lucio Ball and Desi Arnaz, we had trailer park food. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a whole immersive event. And uh, when we did Mary Poppins, I was just throwing, we were going to the party store and I was throwing in this and throwing in that and the cart was filling up and she goes, Gilmore, please. And this seems like a lot. I said, oh no, don't worry, don't worry. People love this movie, they're gonna sell out. <laughs> well, we had sold out every movie up to that point. <laughs> and it, the universe had slapped me across the face because <laughs> Lori was trying to tell me we're spending a lot of money and we lost our shirts on that one. <laughs> so now, to this day, whenever we do something and I'm getting a little overzealous, she'll go, Mary Poppins. <laughs> Mary Poppins. <laughs> Like, okay, 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 I'm pulling back, I'm pulling back. <laughs> That's a, that code word, Mary Poppins. Code words, Mary. Yes. 20 years later. Reverend Lori, do you remember that the same way? Yeah, that was pretty accurate. <laughs> oh, right on. yeah, I, I get so excited about stuff and I don't, I don't, I don't really think ahead. And so that's what happens. Uh, well, so talking about, uh, speaking of producing things, tell us, tell us the story about your wedding. Which also includes Reverend oh, Laurie Savage. Yes, yes. Okay. So when, <laughs> this when, is great. when the state of California said that, it, that we could get married, uh, my husband turned to me and this is how he proposed. He said, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> the romance. Oh, what do you do with that? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, now, I didn't want this just to be, you know, just the ceremony. I, it had to be a full one act musical. You get two you know, musical comedy queens together and you have to do something. So the conceit of our wedding, and it's on, it's on YouTube, just look for Gilmore Rizzo and you'll find it. It's in about 10 parts. But the conceit is the, it's the day before the wedding. So everything, so it's the rehearsal. So everything that could possibly go wrong does. And it's with music and a lot of it's established music. Some of it was written by our friends, uh, friend Wayne Moore, who's an amazing composer, lyricist. And then at the end, our very, because uh, it was, it's our, our big gay Jewish Italian wedding. That's what it is online. And uh, I wanted a big Italian you know, wedding and he wanted a big Jewish wedding. So uh, our, and I didn't want it to be gay at all, not at all. So uh, our big gay wedding planner decides that he wants to make it big and flashy and, uh, so that's what that's also the energy. I don't want that, and yet it. So at the very end, it culminates in the ceremony. 
And uh, I never cried so hard in my life because we had 25 people in the cast, I mean, in the wedding party. And we had 200 people in the audience. Most of them were science of mind ministers who said this was the best wedding they'd ever attended. And they had been to many weddings. That's and cool. and I, I had to inflict my poor Lori, my dear Reverend Lori, on he to learn how to dance. He made me sing and dance. <laughs> she, she, she had the, she had the no. <laughs> Best woman. He's got my best woman capitalized yeah. here, Reverend Lori, in the notes, just so you know. <laughs> she was my best woman, and she had to learn how to clap and sing. <laughs> and <laughs> All at the same time, she said she was going down the aisles of the grocery store, clapping and walking. Just practicing. <laughs> that that is love. That, that is, is love. You know, if 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 you can go and and she's not someone who wants to step in front of an audience, but she was such a trooper. And of mm. course, we had forty pages of dialogue that everybody had to learn. <laughs> yes. said, would you like to be on our wedding sure okay here i'm sending you the script <laughs> we had we had we had an award-winning choreographer we had uh we had bob mackie costumes we had ginger rogers niece Ginny mcmath uh as our director we had a five camera shoot danny bonaducci's sister celia bonaducci who was the greatest director on the planet she's an amazing lady she directed the five camera shoot for our wedding Wow. It was it was editing. We had a an Emmy award winning set designer for our set. <laughs> <laughs> it was big. It was huge. It uh, was big. So was the wedding itself actually? Could you tell? Did you transition into oh, the yeah, ceremony, yeah. or was even it... the light? Even the lighting changed too. Everything. Oh, okay, so it wasn't and, part and... of the show. Well, well yeah, it, it kind of he the 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 gay wedding planner goes okay. Let's see if we can start this from the beginning and get through this. This is this is hour 15. We shouldn't be here this long. And so, yeah, because there's also, we also had a girl like Vanna White who would walk through changing the hours, you know, hour one, hour five, <laughs> hour 10. And, uh, mm. and then, it, then the actual ceremony, which mm. was beautiful. And we had wedding singers and it, yeah, I, I could not have asked for a happier, most blessed day in my life. That sounds and, extraordinary. <laughs> and we had seven people in our audience who were gonna vote against gay marriage until they saw our wedding. They had a very conservative view about one man, one woman, and they went, you just, love is love. You just changed our minds. We're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna vote against it. Mm -hmm. Prop, 8, Prop 8 eventually did win, you know, did get voted in, but God now, bumps, gang. God bumps. God yep, bumps. Yep. And now it's federal, federally, federally, federally recognized, you know, across the board, all fifty yep. states. So, so your love has literally changed people's hearts. That's awesome. Yeah, we when we were going to the uh, Foothill Center, there was a gentleman who approached me and gave me a big hug and said, "When I was younger, I used to beat people up." who are gay. And mm. uh, I hated them up until I met you and your husband. Mm. I thought they don't deserve anything. Why, why do they think they're so special? And then I met the two of you and I want to tell you, I'm sorry. Mm. And that was such a gift that for him to actually come up and reveal that about himself, just, uh, I got, as I said, I, it's a law of attraction. I've been, uh, I've been attracting wonderful, loving spirits and I, I know that will continue. And folks that are willing willing to, to change. Folks that are willing to change. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> God, I should have made a note of it. What did you just say something? Um, and I can't remember. Oh, the I said, wedding. I said something that. Well, you said, yeah, you said something I wanted to do a follow up. I didn't write it. Normally I write it down. I didn't write it down. So now I don't remember. So let's just stick with this theme for a second here, though. Okay. So I, I tell us the story too. This is such a great story about what happened when you were up in the, I don't know why I thought Sacramento. You said Northern California. Oh, that, so that's Sacramento. Yeah. Oh, it was Sacramento. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So I what, was the so what? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's I, what I want to do real, real quick. Gilmore real quick. I just okay. wanted to tell you, uh, <clears throat> um, DJ says what a happy Monday this has turned out to be. Uh, Gilmore is fabulous. Yes. Oh, uh, nice humans crying. 
Thank Tears you. are good. And Nice Human also wants to know, where was the wedding? It was at uh, Spirit Works in Burbank. Oh, okay. Another center for spiritual living. Yep. Uh, and, and they basically gifted us that That's entire awesome. venue. It was, again, law of attraction. Law of attraction. Uh, so, so okay, cool, I, yeah. I was, I was living and doing shows in so great. South California, <laughs> and I did yeah. a show at the Costa Mesa Civic Playhouse. It was, the show was called The Fling. So fast forward, I move up to Northern California, Sacramento area, and I see, this is about three years, almost three years later, they're doing the show at the, the award-winning Equity Theater, Sacramento Theater Company. Oh, they're there doing, it is. Okay, yep, yep. They're doing, they're doing that show. So I thought, okay, I want to go see it because no one's ever done it. It's a great little comedy, romantic comedy. And I go to I'm, my friend, uh, John, whose cousin was producing the show. Uh, he got the tickets for us. We sat down and his cousin comes down the, the aisle and she's a little panicked. And they're talking, I said, oh, you know, I did this show. I did this show about three years ago. I played the part of the sun. And she goes, oh, oh, oh da, da, da. and she walks away. <laughs> John and I are waiting and the curtain's being held. The media's there, the Sacramento Bee, the news, you know, they're all, this is opening night. And it's, the curtain's being held for almost 20 minutes. Now, that's unusual, yes? Oh, is oh that... yes. Oh, yeah. It should, we should have started the show. Yep. Yeah. You usually hold for about maybe 5, 10, but this was okay. 20 minutes. Okay. His cousin comes running down the aisle and she said, can you come here a minute? She said, what part did you play? And I said, the part of the sun. She said, can, you, can I talk to you a minute? We're going up the aisle. And as we're going up the aisle, she says, the actor who played the sun is not here. We can't get a hold of him. This was before cell phones. So mm -hmm. they're trying to call him, trying to find out where the heck he is. As we're going up the aisle, she said, do you think you could do the part? She said, we'll get you And you're in your chair, ready to watch it. Yes, just in your yes, seat. and I had, I, it's been three, almost three years since I did that show. So I'm thinking, I, I, I think, can you get me a script? And she said, well, you can go on with script if you want. So I go backstage, they introduce me to the, per, the, the actors and actresses who are playing my mother, my father, my aunt, my uncle, they go on. There's only six people in this show. Mm. So they give me a script, they give me this gentleman's clothes and they fit me like they were tailor-made. Wow. Me. Wow. I put the clothes on. The other I'm actors' running. clothes. The other actors' clothes. Yes, the other actors' yeah. clothes. And they they start the show. They're starting this, and my scene's coming up, and I'm running the, the two scenes I'm in with the stage manager. She said, do you want to go on with book? We ran it like three or four times. I was able to, all those words came back to me. I go out on stage. The minute I step on stage, the actor who was supposed to play the son enters the green room and hears my voice over the loudspeaker and he so thinks wild. oh my gosh they've had an understudy in the wings waiting for this uh, and so he wrote this long apologetic letter mm. about, i'm so sorry i didn't know that the time had been changed and blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and after the show after i got off the stage the uh, the artistic director of the theater said we'd like you to stay in the role can you do it and I said, I can't, I'm, I'm opening in the Canterbury Tales this weekend. I, I'm committed. I would do wow. it. Yeah. So they, they said, you were funnier than the guy that they had cast. We don't, anytime you want to be in a show here, you're more than welcome. So and they were going to can, they were going to can the other guy, huh? Yep. And have, <laughs> it was, I, time, I, I don't people. think I could, I don't think I could do that today. I had a little more chutzpah uh, guts back then that I just uh, sure sure yeah, I'll look, yeah, we'll be in the game, game yeah yeah there have been a lot of things in my life that I've actually without thinking have stepped up um, I'm gonna tell a story right now really quickly um, I went to Go lunch with, with Reverend Lori and we we love nachos we she loves the filet mignon nachos and she she was eating oh no and all of a sudden, <laughs> I see this look on her face. Let the man tell the story, her, Reverend Lori. Her, her, her eyes bug out, and she's like, mm, mm, mm. and she takes a sip of water, and it all comes back up. And I see immediately she is choking to death. And she, she's looking around. She stands up, and I hear people around me saying, she's choking, she's choking, she's choking. So no one was doing anything, and I just instinctively 
turned her around, did the Heimlich maneuver. I never did it in my entire life, did it twice. I heard somebody say, oh, he got it. So whatever had choked her with came up. And the only reason I knew how to do the Heimlich maneuver, I wasn't trained. I've watched Mrs. Doubtfire a bazillion times. <laughs> and when in the, in, this, in the movie, Robert Williams, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, he does the Heimlich maneuver in the movie and that's how I learned how to do it. Mm. So I, if it was anybody else, I probably would have sat there and said, are you having a problem? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 I would save her any time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, call her, I call her my witchy woman because whenever I'm on the ledge and I want to jump off and kill myself, I call her and she's, you know, you know this stuff, Gilmore. You know that your mom, you just turn yourself around, take a deep breath and just know. Just know who you are, know that you are a part of God, you are God, everything is good. And she always says the magic spell, ding, ding, ding. Yep. and- uh, <laughs> A great friend. Yep, yep, I, I adore this woman. Yep. Okay. I, uh, I actually, uh, Pierce Brosnan. Yeah, Pierce Brosnan, thank you. Yep, yep, thank you, yeah, totally. You know, I, I, I kind of have a similar story with my grandfather. We were at a family meal and he was kind of, you know, advancing in Parkinson's a little bit and he choked, he was choking on a piece of steak and I noticed it and it was like, and I just, I did it. It's a funny thing. I, I did the Heimlich too. It was like without, it's like something needs to be done. I'd never done it on anybody before either. And lo and behold, then this big chunk of meat flies out and everything's fine. And he had the, <laughs> and, you know, just, they, they say that if you don't do it right, you could break someone's ribs. You can, or, or do, doing it right. You can also break their ribs apparently. Because you just so so later that afternoon he pulls my two uncles aside and he says, "Geez, don't you think Charlie could have been a little bit easier on me?" <laughs> like, okay, Graham, you want me to save your life? Save his life. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Next time I will. That's great. Thanks for the gratitude. You... Gramps. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Graham. Exactly. I love this. You call yourself a Disney file. To walk us through that a little bit. Oh. You're so funny. I'm. I, well, you know, I was. I was What's a Disney raised, file. I was raised in Cal Orange County, so we we would sit on the roof of our house and watch the fireworks. Mm. And every year, my dad would have two weeks of vacation. He, he and my mom would go to Las Vegas for a week, and then the rest of the his vacation would be all the amusement parks. And we'd always go to Disneyland. I'd go to Disneyland with my friends from school uh, for birthdays, for every occasion. Family would come in from New York and we would go to Disneyland. So it's something that's just a part of me. If you are a North, Southern California kid, or if you're in even that Orange County area, it's just part of who you are. So I go as much as I can. I, it was a season pass holder and uh, enjoy it very much. Uh, it's just an opportunity to people watch, which I mm -hmm. love. Yep. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, so that's kind of bothering me. It's not, it's not as, you know, pure as Disneyland used to be. But anyway, uh, a friend of ours who's no longer with us, she knew everybody at the Disney company. Wow. And okay. she got us every year for the, for like six years, um, into club 33. So I would mm. invite 10 of my favorite people and we would go to Club 33. And what is Club 33, Gilmore? It's the exclusive club that they have above the Pirates of the Caribbean. And it's mm -hmm. something like, I think companies have to pay like $10,000 or $75,000 a month or something like that. Or Whoa. It's, it's really expensive. And it's, and it's by invitation only and you can't get in. And you, it's, so she gifted me with that. That's another, that law of attraction thing. Yeah. So wow. we would go and spend three hours eating because mm. <laughs> they had this great buffet and then they would give you an entree. Oh, on and top you, of and, the buffet, you get an entree? Uh, oh yes, oh yes. And the, and the balconies outside in New Orleans Square that you could walk around on. If you were in that club, you can go out and sort of leisurely look down at the crowd and you know, the peasants. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I, Pirates of the Caribbean, always my favorite ride. Oh, I, I, I gotta kid. tell you, we have to go sometime. I would love that. I think it'd be fun. 
You know what, Gilmore? My daughter hasn't been yet. She's seven. And I, so I, I don't know if that's the wheelhouse, oh. but maybe you want to be part of her first visit there. I oh, I, I, I would be, I would love to be your tour guy. That would be so rad. Totally. Is it, is it going to, I mean, where, where are they with opening back up? Well, Shanghai has opened up. Uh, Florida's reopened, but Disneyland, because for some reason they haven't gotten it right. I don't know if it's because maybe the, the park is smaller than any of the other parks in the world, the Disney parks. So I think they're having trouble setting that up, the distancing. Yeah. That's what I love about Disneyland. It's, it's charming. The charm of it just being a small, intimate park. Florida Amen. is huge. It's, it's, yeah, it's huge, right? Yeah. Huge, yeah. Well, that, that's cool. Thanks for saying that. that. That would make it so much more. Her grandma wants to come down from Seattle. Oh. Where we would make these things a, a family event. That would be so much fun to have you come. That would, I would be honored. Yeah, would, cool. Love it. You hey, haven't, got a gone, comment to, here. You well, haven't gone to Disneyland until you've gone with Gilmore. Love it. I'm, I'm pumped. What a blessing. Law of attraction. <laughs> Uh, let's see, great newbie. Reverend Charles, will today's session be available on YouTube? Really want Russ to see this. Fabulous. A million thanks to both you and Gilmore. What an inspiration and can so relate to many of the stories. That's awesome. You know, I, I, I believe that my grandparents, I used to go to my grandpa, grandma and grandpa Rizzo's house all the time. And I would walk to their front door. And of course, the aroma of cooking was spectacular. And of course, you know, grandpa's pipe tobacco and she always had freshly cut roses on the dining room table and the mm -hmm. Italian music would be playing. And I think that really set me up for being, being who I am today, mm -hmm. as far as the presence and knowing that even though she was very Catholic, she, whenever there was an emergency, she'd be doing her rosary, crying, rocking in her chair and, and oh no, you, you, you don't have to eat fish on Friday anymore. Oh, they have rock and roll music at the Catholic church. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I believe that they were very progressive in their thinking. And I believe that a lot of what she believed is very much of what science of mind is. I yeah. believe that Ernest Holmes, she would have connected with that because of who she was. Amen. Heartful. Sounds like you just come from a big fat heart, just a big heart, huh? That's your family. By the way, I didn't answer the question. All of our material, I think that was from D. D, all of our material is on YouTube. So uh, you can actually ap absolutely go back and you'll be able to find the show on there. And, and I'm probably going to watch it again too, just to laugh a little bit more also. I, I, I know that I've been watching, like, talking with my hands too much. Oh my gosh. I love it. Well, we're doing fine. We're doing great. The craziest my working, part. My working for the camera director is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> the animated. Um, <laughs> we're getting to the top of the hour here, which is kind of crazy. We might have to do this again. We might have to do it again down the road. Yeah. Would you um? Would you be willing to sing a little something for us before we sign off? Oh. oh. No, you don't have to. It's just you know. What I don't I don't have any. Nothing that's no, no, okay. Know. Okay. Anyway, I mean, I wouldn't be a good oh, interviewer. Come if, I on. You, if I didn't try and put you on the spot, Gilmore, I wouldn't be a good interviewer. <laughs> yeah, no, no. The I, voice I, of God is speaking. Sing. Oh, wow. I, what, what, I, 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 let me think about it. Let me think about it. how much time. All right. Well, we, uh, well, in actuality, what's because I'm going to say some more. You have, you have, uh, I don't know, two minutes, let's give you, we'll give you two minutes. Just a couple of lines or something if you think about it. While you are, I'm just gonna do a couple of announcements. And, uh, and then Reverend Lori, uh, I think is gonna be thoroughly disappointed in you for years to come if you don't end up singing something. So anyway, let me do these few announcements. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you don't wanna disappoint your friend that badly, come on. Uh, let's see, tomorrow is uh, chapter two, or chapter two, chapter nine. Uh, with Jafon Seeley of the book, We Continue to Walk Through How to Be an Anti-Racist. Wednesday, the Sensational Six continues to bring inspiration to our community in the way that they do so beautifully. Uh, then on Thursday, my guest on Thursday is who? Where's my schedule? I don't have my schedule in front of me. Um, oh, it's part two with Charles Holt. We did part one a few weeks ago. It's part two with Charles Holt. If you haven't seen part one, please go back and look at... Uh, 
the first part of our interview. Charles got has wonderful stories as well, and and uh, and and just a just a great chat for an hour. So part two with him on Thursday. Friday is life on love with me. Saturday meditation. Sunday service, and then we just keep rocking and rolling. Uh, and and all is well, and life is good. So that's what's going on. And of course, we continue to appreciate love and support your financial support of our center. It's so important right now uh, to give what you can, give what you're able to give in, in an inspired way um, and, and to, to continue to support the building, our staff, our programming, um, and continue to support yourself and just participating in the law of circulation, um, sharing your, your financial good with a center that you love and, and know and, and uh, that brings all of us so much joy. So there's a donate link uh, that's clear. That's right down below. I believe the dialog box someplace on your screen there where you can donate and share your financial good with the center. We're always grateful for that. Gilmore, come on, just a couple of lines of something. What do you have for us, pal? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <clears throat> Not warmed up. Uh, let's see. Um, how about, uh, let's see, a song that Lori always requests. Um, but you know, Okay, so when I was a little boy, I used to go to my uh, grandparents' house and there's one forty-five that my sister and I could not get enough of. It was a song recorded in 1962 by Lou Monti called Papino the Italian Mouse, about a mischievous <laughs> mouse that lives in the walls of a man's kitchen. We would put that heavy needle down on the 45 and we'd hear the little mouse say, Signore and signora, io mi chiamo Papino Zorigina. And what a moulinian. Papino, oh, you little mouse, so won't you go away? Find yourself another house to run around and play. You scare my girl, you eat my cheese, you even drink my wine. I try so hard to catch you, but you trick me all the time. <laughs> a little bit. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you for a taste. That's, love it. Uh, Thank you. No, you're good. That was good. I mean, that's, that was awesome. You did that at the center uh, in January or February, right before we yes. closed down, I think. Yeah, that was the last time I performed was doing my show. It's called That's Amore, More, an American Italian songbook. And it's based on the four women in my life, my two grandmothers, my mom and my sister, and the recipes that they made. Mm. Uh, and then someone in the, in the audience wins a huge Italian basket and the recipes for uh, of the appetizer, the soup and salad, the uh, entree and the dessert. Because the show's broken up into four different uh, courses of a meal. Mm. And uh, the, the last part is the, the dessert when I talk about my mom. Love it, cool. Thanks for sharing. Uh, this was so much fun, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Charles. I really appreciate you. And thank you for inviting me. I had a great absolutely. time. Absolutely. Come back on again sometime, would you? And thank um, you, Lori. Yeah. Thanks, Gilmore. You're for, welcome. Uh, yeah. Big love to, to Reverend Lori and the producer's booth. We appreciate you so much and continue to appreciate Swing Point Media. And uh, thank you, Gilmore. Have an extraordinary Labor Day, my friend. Thank you. Thank and you. Too. Much Pleasure. love to you and Brian. Much love to you and Brian. Thank you.